Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord, and I'm going to ask the Lord to be, uh, the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. I just want to remind you, we don't come to the house to hear from a man or to hear from a woman or the old or the young. Let's not play the favorites game or anything like that, because, you know, we don't come to hear from men. And we'll see a little bit about that tonight. We come to hear from God. So I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to ask and invite the Holy Spirit to be our teacher in this place tonight. So as I get on my knees, if, you be, if you're able to stand, would you join me? Let's pray together, and let's prepare our hearts to hear the Word of God tonight. So, Father, we come before you in this house. And Lord, we're just so honored and so grateful to be here. Lord, we don't take it for granted that we have the opportunity, the blessed opportunity to come and to worship you freely without fear for persecution. Lord, when we have seen oh so much lately, especially around the world of our brothers and sisters, uh, our fellow brothers and sisters around the world that are being persecuted and driven out and killed for the name of Jesus. Lord, here we are tonight freely open and able to worship and to hear your word. So Father, we thank you that we don't come into this place for tradition. Lord, we don't come for ritual or we don't come to hear from a man or a woman. We come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ that's the senior leader of this church. And it's in the name of Jesus we ask that your precious Holy Spirit would be our teacher today, would be our counselor and our our, our guidance. Lord, I pray that as we open up the word of God, Lord, that it would be rich and alive and powerful to our lives. Lord, I pray that it would be like a seed. uh, uh, The word of God is a seed, our hearts being the ground. Lord, a seed planted into good, fertile ground as we hear the word of God. Lord, I ask that you would help us to open our ears to hear and our eyes to see your word today, Lord, that we might be equipped to be your church, to shine your glory around the world. Thank you, Father, so much for all the blessings that you've given to us. Lord, we don't ask these blessings upon ourselves, but upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are teaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't ever think of ourselves as better or higher than anybody else, but we are really co-laborers, brothers and sisters working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, we thank you that your hand would be upon all the churches across the world and across the Inland Empire that are meeting this week and tonight. Lord, we thank you for them. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in, in the Middle East that are facing tremendous and immense persecution. Lord, we ask that your hand would be upon them. Lord, we look to you, our Redeemer and our Deliverer. Father, we thank you for that. Lord, all the petitions that we have around the world Lord, we thank you that your hand is upon this, Lord, and we thank you that your will be done and your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So you be the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, tonight what I'd like to do is I'd like to resume uh, just, just out of curiosity. How many of you here were, last, were here last week? All right, good, good. That means I don't have to spend a lot of time recapping because we're going to talk about, last week we talked about uh, between a rock and a hard place. And tonight we're going to resume our study and resume that. I'm going to give you a second part of Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Now for those of you that are just joining us or that you weren't here with us last week, we, we looked at a story, we read the encounter of, of, of a, a setting up of a memorial, so to speak. And if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me. We'll look there as the topic of our discussion tonight continues on from the same area. In the book of 1 Samuel in the 7th chapter, the book of 1 Samuel in the 7th chapter, we see that after many years of... Israel facing a hardship against the Philistines uh, and the Ark of the Covenant being taken captive during one of the battles that uh, Samuel the prophet has uh, enticed or challenged Israel to repent and cleanse themselves of their ways to leave their idols and go after and follow after God as they give a sacrifice to God. They go to war, the Philistines show up to battle against them once again, outnumbering them, and they kind of look to each other and say, what do we do? And the the Bible goes on and tells us that the voice of God came upon the Philistines, confused them, and Israel pursued after them and, and, and literally slaughtered them, destroyed them. And as we do, we see in 1 Samuel, the seventh chapter, verse number 12, after that is all over, we see that Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer saying, thus far, the Lord has helped us. Now, last week we described that Ebenezer is a word study. Eben literally meaning rock in Hebrew, and Ezer, or Haezer, literally meaning help. Meaning, the word of Ebenezer literally means then the rock of help, or our rock of help. And God is that to us, you and I are Ebenezer. So now if you ever wonder, if you've ever heard that uh, old school hymn where it says, here I raise my Ebenezer, you know what I'm talking about? You, some of you are like, no, it's all right, you may hear it. 
We're not talking about Ebenezer Scrooge. So get that, because I know I was there once before. You know, you're not lifting up Ebenezer Scrooge. Here I raise my rock of help. God is our rock of help. And last week, one of the things that we discussed is when we are facing a hard place or when we get into a hard place, we have the decision between a hard place and the rock. The rock being God. So we learn that we've got to go to the rock. Now, the rock is God. Now, I would love and, and I will put in our application to say that, hey, that's also a double meaning. When you face a hard time or you're facing a hard place, hey, get to the rock, all right? But first and foremost, God, our rock. But then you can add the Rock Church and World Outreach Center because I believe it's a great place to be when you're going through hard times. We talked about standing on the rock. We got to learn sometimes to just stand and not run about, not move about, not get all busy and get all active and, and the things. When we're facing a hard time, oftentimes we want to go. As soon as, as soon as things start to look a little bit better, we're right out there hitting the ground again. And we got to learn sometimes we just got to stand and be still and know that God is in control. And we learned last week that we've got to build on the rock, to, to build the foundations of our life. Everything that we live, everything that we breathe has got to be built upon the rock of God, of God our help. And today I want to take a look at... God, our rock, once again, between a rock and a hard place. And, and it's been on my heart. And I was talking to my wife this, this afternoon as I was kind of going over the message. I always bounce uh, the, the messages off of, she's like my sounding board. And she's brutally honest. And I was bouncing this off with her. And I just said, you know, I, she said, well, how do you feel about it? I said, you know, I'm getting to the point where I feel like I just keep beating on that horse. And she's like, what do you mean? I says, man, it seems like every time I preach, it's about hard times. Every time I preach, it's about, it's about battles. Every time I'm teaching, it's about something. And I believe that as I was praying today and this afternoon, God really spoke to me and said, listen, we have got to understand as a church that we have got to know what to do when an emergency or when hard times come our way. Because if we don't, panic will set across and we will go and spread like cockroaches in the light. And so God really kind of set my heart, set my mind at ease. Now, I'm not getting on my soapbox talking about doomsday or apocalypse or, or the, you know, something happened over here and you all got to get your can of beans and your stash. I'm not talking about that. But what I am talking about is you and I have got to learn some things about God in our life so that when hard times come our way, because as we have beginning just to see the tip of the iceberg of what persecution really means in the 21st century. We don't see it as much in America, but we are seeing what's going on in Iraq. We've heard about what's going on in the Philippines and Indonesia and, these, and, and in Central Africa and these areas. We have got to learn that God is our rock and there will be times in our lives where we will be in a hard place in life and we have got to learn to go to the rock. And so here as we see that Samuel set up this stone, a memorial that said the Lord has helped us, meaning God our rock. I, I was studying and last week one of the verses that we used in our point of going to the rock was the book of Psalms in the 18th chapter. In Psalms in the 18th chapter, David is, is literally speaking or singing to God uh, of his glories, of his goodness, and delivering uh, of God's deliverance. Now, the, the pretense of this is that it says that David is singing to God or speaking to God of being delivered from his enemies and from Saul. And so today we're going to look at that. We're going to go back to the book of Psalms in the 18th chapter. We're going to look back at verse number 2, and we're going to look at the attributes of God, our rock, in our lives, and what that means. It's a little bit different for me. Uh, I guess at the church we've just gotten used to, we've gotten accustomed to having, you know, point number one, point number two, point number three, point number four. Today there are no points. Simply put, I just want to go through Psalms in the 18th chapter, verse number two, and look at these attributes of God that the psalmist, as he glorifies God, says to you and I so that we can have an understanding of God so that when hard times come, because it's not a matter of if, it's not a matter of, well, maybe this or that. It's a matter of when. And I know, I'm not trying to be the bearer of bad news. I'm not trying to throw a wet blanket on our lives. But the reality is, is Jesus told his disciples, you will face persecution, but be of good cheer. Because I have overcome the world, you and I have got to learn the attributes of God, our rock, our rock of help, so that we can live and be successful in life. Are you with me today? So Psalms in the 18th chapter, verse number 2, David says this. He says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. 
Now, some say that David wrote this. We first actually see this psalm in 2 Samuel, the 22nd chapter. It's slightly different. And this is where David is literally speaking this to God. And now we see it recorded in the book of Psalms for you and I as he's speaking to God. And now some say that David wrote this when he was young, when he had been delivered from Saul in his, in his times of trial. Others say that David wrote this psalm or wrote this song or this poem to God when he was older, well advanced in life. Either way... We have got to understand that David is a man from the beginning to the end of his career with God was a man that had been delivered over and over and over by God. Can, can we all agree on that one? If you recall, before Goliath ever came, there was the bear and the lion. Then there was the giant. Then there was the king of Israel. That's a bad place to be in right there. Then there was the Philistines. Then there was his family. It was over and over and over again. And yet God was faithful to this man, David. And here David is crying out to God, saying, God, you are my rock, my rock of help, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom I I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So today, today what I want to do, I just want to take each one of those statements and let's just talk, let's just look at a little bit of in-depth of what these ideas that David is laying out here to God and what they are to you and I. So we talked about last night or last week, God being our rock. That was last week's message. So number one or the first thought idea of, of tonight was last week, God our rock. Now let's go and let's look at Psalms, the 18th chapter, verse number two. And David says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. I love the descriptive uh, element here that David gives us as a fortress. You know, a fortress is a place of refuge. It's something that where you would seek shelter from onslaught or from attacks. It's usually often surrounded by wilderness or open areas. It's, it's literally a place of retreat. Think back to the old western days. In the Wild West, there were forts out in the middle of the wilderness. You get the idea because you've seen those old John Wayne movies and, and, and Clint Eastwood films, you know. They got the logs going up and they got the little tower in the middle and everything else was just wilderness on the outside. So the psalmist David says to us that God is our fortress, literally a place of refuge, a fortified city or military dwelling. And this is the description of God, is that God is our fortified dwelling, a place of refuge. When hard times come, we have a place to go. First thing we've got to understand is that we have got a have to, we have got to understand we have a place to go in God. You think about it oftentimes. A fortress, much like a castle or, or a, a strong wall or a strong tower. Oftentimes, there were many inhabitants that lived on the outside of that fortress. But when hard times come, when attacks would come or when, when uh, enemies would come their way, they would retreat from their homes, retreat from their villages, leave all behind, and they would run into through the doors of the fortress and they would lock those doors, bolt those doors, uh, and, 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 and they would hold out and they would have a place of peace and that God is our fortress, our refuge, a place to go when we have hard times. What an amazing thought to understand that God is our refuge in life. When we went camping, I showed you a picture last week of my wife and I would just return from uh, backpacking uh, six days in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Oftentimes I'd said that I learned the difference between people. There are people that like the outside and there are people that don't like the outside because the people that like the outside are like, man, that's really cool. And the people that don't like the outdoors are like, why would you do that? One of the things that we, we saw when we were there, and I've been there and in other areas before, is when you get to a high elevation, when you get above the tree line, you're exposed to the elements. When wind or when rain comes, there's no shelter. There's no trees to hide underneath. And over the decades and, and hundreds of years, literally, that people have been spending time in the wilderness, there have been clearings made out of rocks, or they have been taking every rock that's out there, and they have stacked them up and made stone walls because the wind would come every day or every evening from the west or from the east or whatever direction that canyon might lead the wind, and it would blow, and people would, would have nowhere to go. 
And so we camped one night and we were there and we knew it was a windy night. There was already a breeze blowing and we found a spot where there was a huge boulder on the side. And we put our tent as close as we could to the boulder so that as the elements came, as the wind and the cold air blew in the nighttime, we knew that it wouldn't shake. We knew that it wouldn't rattle. We knew that it wouldn't keep us awake, that we could have peace and that we could have rest. Why? Because we were literally hiding in the cleft of the rock. And that is exactly what God is to us. We live a life exposed out in the elements, in the real world of this day and age where we are exposed to the elements. But there is a place that you and I can go, that we can go and we can lean against, that we can barricade ourselves into the fortress of God, the place that is fortified where no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Why? Because God is our fortress. We don't rely on the security and the safety of the stock market or the real estate market. Hello. On the gas prices, on how nice uh, possessions we have. Why? Because we know they come and they go. Our refuge is from God. I love how the psalmist says, and I'll just put this on the overhead. Psalms in the 46th chapter. I took you there to verse number 10. I said that that was one of my favorite verses of the Bible, and it truly is. Psalms in the 46th chapter, verse number 1. The psalmist says, God is our refuge and our strength. Listen to this. A very present help. In trouble. Don't you love that? A very present help in trouble. God is our fortress. You know what's neat about that? Generally, fortresses don't move. Castles, have you ever seen somebody try to move a castle? Doesn't happen, right? You get too far away from the castle, you're out on your own. But God is our very present help, which means wherever we are in life, all we need to do is to look to God as our fortress, our refuge, our strength, our present help in trouble. And we realize and we can understand that God is always there. He will never leave us nor forsake us. What a neat thought that is right there. Hallelujah. We're talking about looking at Psalms in the 18th chapter. So if you've got your Bibles and you had your Bibles open there, go back. Let's look at it again. Psalms in the 18th chapter, verse number 2. David says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. God is our deliverer, church. He's our hero. He's the one that goes before us. He's our George Washington crossing the river in, 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 in the paintings, uh, ready to fight the redcoats. God is the one that goes before us, that delivers us out of the arms of darkness, that takes the evil forces and the things that would try to destroy us to take our lives away. God is the one through Jesus Christ, our deliverer, has pulled us out. But the beautiful thing is he's not just our deliverer. He's our redeemer. He's washed us, cleansed us, brought us by, bought us by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are now washed as clean as snow, the Bible tells us. What an awesome thing that is. In 2 Corinthians, in the first chapter, speaking of our deliverer, this is an amazing statement. When we think that we've got hard times, when we think that we've got some, some, some trouble our way, 2 Corinthians, in the first chapter, Paul the Apostle is writing to the church, and it's really in his exhortation, he's, he's, he's speaking to the church. 2 Corinthians in the first chapter, verse number, verse number 8, Paul, Paul the Apostle, where, where we're going to pick up. Let me read you the verses previous to that. They really are, he's talking about the hardships of, his, of what they've had. They've had some pretty hard times, and he begins to talk about this to the church. And I'm, I love the statement that Paul makes, and we've got to live this. This has got to be our mantra for life. And so verse number 8, he says, you know, we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. That we were burdened beyond measure. I don't know about you, but burdened beyond measure, that's pretty bad. That, that's, that's not financial crisis, okay, I got to start. A burden beyond measure, he goes on and he says, we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, that we despaired even of life. Paul, Paul here's, here's an amazing statement. Paul the Apostle, the author of two-thirds of the New Testament, is saying there was a time in our ministry where we couldn't even deal with life. It was so hard. Wow. You know, one of the comforts that we have is knowing that the trials that we go through, we're not alone. That we're not the only ones in the world that are going through hard times. Here, Paul the Apostle is sharing, listen, it was so tough 
so hard that we despaired life itself. Verse, on, verse number 9, he says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. We were thinking, man, let's just roll over and die in ourselves. Why? That we should not learn to trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. I love what Paul the Apostle says, we should, we will, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Now, I want, to, I want you to pay attention to the term that says, but in God who raises the dead. But in God. Why? Because look what verse number 10 says. But in God who delivered us from so great a death, who does deliver us, and whom that he will still deliver us. Do you, do you see what Paul the Apostle just said? That we would learn to trust in God who delivered us, past tense, who delivers us, present tense, and who will deliver us, future tense. Irregardless of what life looks like at the present circumstance, God is our deliverer, past, present, and future. There may be some of you in this place who say, Pastor Luke, I don't have much of a past of deliverance of God. Well, we'll, we'll give you the opportunity tonight to start today and let it start working your way towards the future. But the beautiful thing is, is that God is our deliverer no matter what may come our way. I love that. Past, present, and future. Paul the Apostle, or I'm sorry, Paul the Apostle, David goes on in Psalms, the 18th chapter, verse number two. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. I love this. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My strength, in whom I will trust. God is our strength. We don't rely on the strength of men. We don't lean on our own perseverance or our own fortitude to get us through hard times in life. Why? Because the hard times will come and they will go and we, the, the strength of men will come and it will go, but God is our strength. Much like we talked about to stand on the rock, to build on the rock. Remember that he who hears my words and does them, I will liken him to a man who builds upon the rock. Jesus said, we talked about that last week. God is our strength. Our our foundation. I love how he says, in whom I will trust. I'm not going to put my trust in my own ability. I'm not going to put my trust in somebody else's ability to get me through my hard times. I'm going to put my trust in God's ability. Why? Because God is my strength. The source of my fortitude comes from God. In the Love Rock Cafe, if you've ever been in there, they have really good food. Um, short, short little plug. They, there's these big wooden beams and big wooden pillars. You guys kind of know, you know what I'm talking about? You've been there? Big beams and big pillars. Right over where all the food is at, there's these big, like, 25-foot-long wooden beams. And I remember at the time, it was a family member that was, that was building that or constructing that, and I was over there, and I was actually in the video department at the time, and I was filming the progress of the Love Rock Cafe. And they, they said, hey, listen, listen, we need you to put the camera down. We got to lift this big old beam up, and we don't have enough guys, so... Luke, you get on that end, I'm going to get on this end, he's going to get on that end. We're going to all get on the ladder at the same time, and we're going to lift this up, and we're going to put this beam up and just hold it in place, and we'll, we'll do the bolts, and we'll, we'll, we'll secure it in place. All right, cool, great, you know. 23, 24-year-old guy, I'm like, sweet, you know, my chance to really show it. <laughs> yeah. So we all get that beam, and all right, one, count of three, one, two, you know, we're all lift, lift with the knees, lift with the knees, we get the beam right here, cool, great. Wonderful. All right, ready? One, two, three. Flip it up to the show. All right, cool. We got this. All right, ready? Let's go. Beam up over the head. Uh-oh. <laughs> Little 175-pound 175, 175 pastor Luke at the time. You know, the beam started, the beam probably weighed four times that, and all of a sudden I start feeling gravity. Uh-oh. <laughs> I dropped that beam on me. Fell down to the ground by the grace of God. You're, you're all cringing. By the grace of God, he protected me. But I will never forget the moment my pride was shot. <laughs> all the other guys on staff are like, are you okay? Run. And they all throw the beam down on the ground. You all right? Oh, my goodness. You know, my family member, dad's going to kill me. <laughs> I was not strong enough to lift that beam on my own at the end. Yet I try. Spiritually speaking, we're not strong enough as human beings 
to endure the hardships that life has, that life will bring our way on our own and be successful. We have got to learn that we have got to have help in our lives and to not rely on our own strength. As Americans, we like to have, the, the, we like to say that we, we have the resolve. I'll get through this. You can put, you know, you, you always hear it. It's always the comeback story. You, you push me down. You tell me to be quiet. You, the, the more you, you more you push against me, the bigger I get. We like to hear that. We remember the, 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 the Titans movie and all these other type of things, you know, the football teams that they, they came out from, you know, the, 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 the underdog story. That's just, that's like America. So we have this inside of us. Well, it's, we were strong enough. But God says, listen, you need to understand that it is not your strength that will get you through life. It is my strength. And the sooner we learn to lean on God, the better we are in life because God is our rock, immovable, our strength. I love how Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, you were there in, in the first chapter, a couple pages over if you're still there. Paul the Apostle is talking about the thorn in his flesh and he talks about there was something, a messenger of Satan sent uh, to buffet him and he says, I prayed to God three times to remove this messenger. And finally he gets the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's so amazing. In the middle of 2 Corinthians we see the words of Christ in red. Why? Because Jesus Christ speaks these words to Paul the Apostle and he said to me, verse number 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul goes on and he says, Therefore, most gladly, I'll rather boast in my infirmities, uh, that, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I love this verse number 10. He goes on and he says, Therefore, I'll take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. Why? Because when I am, street, when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because now we realize, like Paul the Apostle had just said, we had, been, we had uh, put a death sentence on our own lives that we may not trust in ourselves, but in God. When I am weak, now I have learned that I tried to pick the beam of life up over my head and it fell back on me. But there I was on the ground and God came alongside through Jesus Christ and he picked that beam up and he said, hey, listen, I got this. You just need to lean on me. God is is our strength in whom we trust. God is our strength in whom we trust. The psalmist says some put their trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We will remember the name of the Lord our God. God our help. God our provider. God our strength. Psalms in the 18th chapter, verse number 2, he goes on and he says... The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I shall trust. I love this one. My shield. God is our shield. A close and personal defense. You see, the fortress is a, is, is a large scale defense mechanism, a place of refuge. The shield is up close and personal. It is on our person at every time. It is something that is part of the integral armor of God that we may hold it up, that we might move it to the left or to the right, that we might block the onslaught or the attacks of the enemy. And here the psalmist is saying, now God, my rock is my shield. My personal defense, up close and personal, guarding the important and yet the things that we might think are little in our lives. I love that, that we can go to God for the big things. But did you know that the little things are not so, bo so below God that we can't go to God for them? I remember you, many of you heard on that Sunday morning when my dogs were, ran away. I keep getting questions at the door. They came back, all right? I, I believe, let me just say this, I believe, I, I, I have to say this because I don't know. I believe they were brought back. But uh, that's a different story for a different day. But I remember when we were praying, when I first started going, I started praying to God about my dogs. My dogs had gone missing. For those of you that know, don't know, I came home from a service. I was preaching over the weekend on a Friday night after a young adult. We had a great night, got home, and my backyard was empty. My gate was left wide open. It was actually propped open by a piece of wood, and my dogs were gone. And then for those of you, the long story short, our dogs have puppies. Our puppies are freedom for our future pledge. So it's kind of like, God, my testimony's gone. And I remember as I was praying with my wife, we were praying for peace and we were praying for comfort. I was kind of like, oh, how silly is this? God, bring my dogs back. 
People around the world are dying. People are starving. People don't have water. And I'm going, God, I want my dogs, my puppies. And I begin to feel silly. And I begin to feel like it wasn't important enough. Like, don't, don't bother God with the little things of life. Only go to God with the big things. And I was reading... Pastor Dan had made mention to me as we were talking, I was reading the same scriptures about uh, the parable of Jesus and the shepherd and the, the lost sheep. And Pastor Dan said, well, you know, God thought it was so important that he let Saul know where his father's donkeys were. And so I started going in and I started reading and the parable of the, Jesus said, if, if a shepherd loses a sheep, wouldn't he leave the 99 to go find the one? And that said to me, God cares enough about the one little measly sheep out of 99. That means God cares about the little the fortress is our refuge for the big, but God, our shield is for the things that jab us, the things that try to give us the, 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 the Chinese torture of a thousand cuts, the devil and his little darts that will try to get us slowly to wither down. God is our shield that we can hold up close to our heart and say, God, the things that are close to my heart, you will guard. So don't be afraid to bring every little matter to God because he cares about you. Yes. Psalms of 28 chapter, I'll put it up on the overhead. The psalmist says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart gladly rejoices. The shield that covers our heart, that covers our life's Proverbs in the 30th chapter. You can just write that down, take notes. You can read it later or, or, or go back and, and mark it in your Bible. But it says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Sometimes, church, we've got to stop repeating what others have said about us or to us. Man, I don't know about you, but I like to focus on the negative. I like, can you believe they said that? Can you believe, I've, I've, always, I've always been an advocate. I've, you've heard me talk about this a bunch of times. You go online, you try to buy something. You don't care about the 55 five-star reviews. You go right to the one star. What is that? What did, what did, what, what did they say? We like to go to, the, well, I'm not going to buy it because that, that one guy at a 500 had a bad, you know, I don't, I don't want that to be me. We focus on that. Well, so-and-so said. They told me when I was a kid. They said I would never. They said I would. And what we do is we start thinking about that over and over and over again. And what we're essentially doing is taking that shield and laying it down on the ground and saying, Hey, devil. Hey, world. Here I am. Throw the darts. I'm a cushiony board just for you. What we have got to do is stop saying what others have said about us. Stop going over what has gone, what has gone on in the past and pick up the shield. The words are truth and words of God are pure and start saying what the word of God says. Hey, I'm not a loser. I'm not a, I'm not a coward. I am mighty. Hey, I'm a great and mighty person of God. God is my, my refuge. He is my rock. He is my fortress. And start picking up that shield. And blocking what the world will try to bring us down. Why? Because God is our shield. Psalms in the 18th chapter, verse number 2, going on. This is a really cool one. Psalms in the 18th chapter, verse number 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my strength, and whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation. The God is the horn of our salvation. That, I know you're like, I know some of us are like, I want to say praise God. What does that mean? Well, let's talk about that. The horn of our salvation. Well, first and foremost, we'll, uh, we'll get to this in a moment, but let me just specify this, that Jesus Christ is the horn of our salvation. But what does that mean? Well, there are three common uses or meanings for horn. So let's talk about them. Number one is a horn to be blown. They, they would blow the horn or the shofar, the, the horn of a ram, to sound, to, to, to glorify, to magnify. It was a battle cry. It was a trumpet used out of the horn of an animal. So God is the sounder of our salvation, proclaiming it, proclaiming it, making it known to the world. Hey, we are here. God says, I love you by Jesus Christ, declaring it on the cross. It is finished. The, the horn was blown from all eternity forward, saying now it has been declared that you have been saved by Jesus Christ. All you have to do is accept Jesus Christ. Now that's a horn that's declaring. A horn is also the, the, the peak of something, the summit of a rock. How about this? The matter horn? The, the ride at Disneyland? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> There's actually a real mountain. I don't know if you knew about that. There's really a mountain called the Matterhorn. How about the Cape Horn? 
the, the peak or the summit of a rock. It is a firm foundation. It is unmoved, unchanged by the weathering. It is, it is, it is not shaken or, or taken away. It is there. It is, uh, the, the, if you think about the horn, the horn of Africa, the horn of South America, faces tremendous and immense storms over and over and over and over again, yet it is still there. Why? Because God is our rock. Now, this is the really cool one, and this is where I believe that the author, uh, uh, the psalmist means, is that the horn is a sign of superiority. You think about it like this. Hey, man, the goat, the ram, the deer, the elk, the moose, whatever it might be that has horns, dude with the biggest horns wins the fight. I remember we were out Lake Mead uh, with my family. We were out there. We were parked in a little cove. It was really neat. We were just swimming and enjoying the weather. And we didn't even notice because they blend in so well. But after a minute, we saw, we heard some noises, and we looked up to the rocks. And there was a whole, I don't know, a cluster, pod, herd, big, I don't know, whatever you call them, group of big horned sheep. I mean, that was really neat. They're so rare, you don't ever see them. So we see this whole family of big horned sheep, and we're like, wow, check that out. Look, look at the horns on those things. You got those big, you know, spirally ones. All of a sudden, we realized there was a whole nother cl cluster, pod, herd, I don't know, whole nother family, let's just say family A, all right, over here, a whole nother herd of big horned sheep. There was a face-off going down right where we were swimming, on a cliff. And so here's the, the herd A, and then there's herd B. And herd B has the big goat, sheep, ram, whatever, okay? Big dude, alpha male. You could see him. Why? You knew it was the alpha male because there he stood on a boulder. Everybody else was behind him. Everybody else was kind of hidden in the rocks. The other little babies were, were like tucked under mom. And it was just a stare down of big, big ram, big sheep looking. What's up? <laughs> and then you see this other, you see the other family. The other, the other alpha male of the group, he, he wasn't as big. I mean, this is from like 40 yards away. And he wasn't as big. And he kind of, it's amazing how they just go straight up the cliff. But he goes up the cliff. And there they are just staring at each other. You could see clearly size made a difference. The big sheep and the little sheep, all right? And they just stared at each other. And you could tell that the little sheep was thinking, okay. <laughs> if I win, this is really good. Probably looked down over the rock. Said, if I lose, there ain't no coming back from this one. So he starts looking at the big sheep looking at the big sheep's horns, looking at his horns, looking, well, my horns are, you know, the, his horns. And that little sheep or that smaller male from the other family walked up to the big one and was like, hey, sorry about you, man. All right. <laughs> they turned around and they went up another way and that family stood their ground. Why? Because his horns gave him the superiority. He was the alpha male, which means that there was no other sheep going to come and try to challenge him because he says, listen, man, I got this pair right here is going to knock you off the cliff. And Jesus Christ is uh, Ze Zacharias' uh, uh, prophecy in Luke, the first chapter, as, he's, as he sees his son John the Baptist being born and he's been uh, mute and deaf for, uh, for nine months during the, the pregnancy of his son. Now all of a sudden his son is born and he begins to prophesy about Jesus. And in verse number uh, 69 of Luke, the first chapter, he says, and, and, and God has raised up a horn of salvation for us out of the house, his servant David, Jesus Christ. Christ is the big horn sheep that ain't gonna nobody gonna come and try to challenge him. He's the five, six point mule deer. He ain't nobody coming after him. The big dog moose in town. Which means the devil gonna try to come your way. It's gonna try to come my way and say, hey, listen, I got this. I'm gonna try to butt, 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 get you out, knock you down. But we have the horn of our salvation. Jesus Christ, the alpha male on our side, God Almighty, the horn of our salvation says, hey, devil, I got a pair of these. What you got? Philippians, the second chapter, I'll just put it up on the overhead. It says, that, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess. I just skipped the verse. Every knee shall bow of those in heaven, those on earth, those on under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you know what that means? Jesus got the big horn. 
the horn of our salvation. That's a pretty cool one. Now when you say, man, the horn of our that's pretty cool. All right. I like that. I like this one. God, number three. Or no, not number three. Last one for tonight. I don't even know where it. Number three came out of. It's not even like number. It's like number six. Anyways. I just got to take off my shoes to count next time. Psalms, the 18th chapter, verse number two. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I trust, my shield, and the horn of my salvation. I love this. My stronghold. God is our stronghold. Now, I love this because this one took me a long time to figure out. Because what is the difference between a fortress and a stronghold? I thought, oh, man, I got all the way to the end of the message. I thought, well, this isn't going to work. It's the same. It's redundant. So then I started to look at it. I started to study. And I began to, to look at the meanings of these words. And a fortress is a fortified garrison, a, a fort or a city or a dwelling that has been fortified, a place of refuge. But a stronghold is not a place of refuge or a rally point. A stronghold is a place of dominance. A fort or a fortified city is, in, is surrounded by wilderness. A stronghold is surrounded by occupation. Oftentimes it's the military headquarters of something. It's the capital city, the stronghold, which means you might be able to get the outskirts of the civilization or the territory, but in order to reach the stronghold, you have to go through the entire nation, the entire village, the entire tribe, the entire army. It is a stronghold, literally meaning a firm grip of the the land or of the battle. And God is our stronghold, which means that God has a firm grip on our lives, which means we ain't, he's not going to let us go, let us fall, let us fail. God is our stronghold, our military superiority. That is a kind of, that is a cool thought right there. Fortress is a place of refuge, a rally point. A stronghold is a place of might or military dominance. In Nahum, the first chapter, you're like, what? I know. Nahum, I'll just put it up on the overhead. If you want to find out where Nahum is, go to the concordance. Look, no, I'm just kidding. Nahum in the first chapter, in order to save us time, because it'll take us all forever to find it. Nahum in the first chapter, verse number seven, it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust. In him. God is our military superiority in our spiritual warfare. God is our might, our victory. We are victorious in, in life because of God. I remember when I played hockey when, when, on one of the teams I played for. We were the best team. It was because I was on it. But we were the best team. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. It was not in spite of the fact that I was on it. We were the best team in the league. Nobody wanted to play us. Every time we came, got to a game, we came out there. And after a while, towards the end of the season, it kind of like took the, took the fun out of the season because it was just like, we're going to win by like 15 points. Like, let's just go out there and try to make them not cry. I mean, that's literally how it was in this, in this season. I remember this. And what we had is we had a stronghold in that league. We were the ones to beat. And God is our stronghold. He's, he's our fortress. He's our strength. He's our refuge. He is our rock. And because of all this, now we are the ones spiritually to beat. Why? Because we don't lean on ourselves. And why? Because we don't, we don't run to our friends or to social media or to, every, uh, to the news for our relief or for our shelter. Why? Because we have God, our rock. And because our rock is immovable, because heaven and earth will, pat, will fade away, but the words of God are immovable and unchangeable, will never fade away. We have God on our side, which means we have a strong hold a firm grip on our lives on the lives of those around us we have a military spiritual stronghold second corinthians in the 10th chapter second corinthians in the 10th chapter you were there previously in the 12th chapter now in the 10th chapter paul the apostle says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but are mighty in god for the pulling down of what Strongholds, which means our stronghold is mightier, stronger, bigger, better than any stronghold the world or the devil might throw our way, which means alcohol, pornography, cigarettes, drugs, addictions, depressions, whatever it might be, uh, sicknesses, disease, whatever it might be, any type of stronghold that would try to come our, our way. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty. Why? Because God is our stronghold and our military superiority spiritually speaking will trump anything that comes our way because God is a God 
who we can base on God as the God, our rock of help today. When we learn to look at God for who he is, when we learn to see that God is our rock, our, our rock of help, when we see that God is our fortress, our place of refuge, that we see God as our deliverer, the one that brings us out over and over again, our hero. God is our strength. God is our shield that covers the, the close and personal parts of our life. God is the horn of our salvation, our stronghold. Now we begin to realize that when hard times come our way, that we can be successful, that we can get through it, that we can be who God has called us to be, to stand up, to rise up, to speak, and to preach the God of Jesus Christ at all times in our lives to reflect the glory and the goodness of God in our lives. Why? Because we rely and we lean on God. Now I love this. There was a common theme throughout all of the scriptures that we read today. And I'm just going to put it like this. The dollar bill says it best. In God we trust. God is our rock. We trust in God, we stand firm in faith on God, our rock. And I'll tell you what, we as a church will be victorious over what the devil would have to throw at us in life. Are you guys with me today? Did you guys get something out of that tonight? <laughs> Praise God. Hey, listen, really quickly, before we leave, I want to just give you the opportunity. I want to talk to you for a minute. Something very important for the... I want to allow the Holy Spirit to, to speak and to move on our behalf tonight. So I want to ask you, just please don't get up, don't leave. Give me a few more minutes of your attention. Let's give a little bit of respect to God and what the Spirit of God wants to do in this place and in your hearts tonight. You know, I, I said a statement that, that God proclaimed salvation from eternity forward on the cross. And God gave each and every one of us the open invitation with no prejudice. The Bible tells us that God is not a respecter of persons, but that does not give us the open door to, to, to say and to proclaim that we are saved or going to heaven based on our own pretenses. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you and I can find our way into heaven because we want to, because we hope so, or because we think so? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because we go to church, because we volunteer, serve as, serve as an usher in the children's ministry, or maybe our parents told us as, as children that we were Christians that we're going to get into heaven. Does, you know, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it mean that you're going to get into heaven because of that thing? Or does it say that? You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven based on your own thoughts, your own pretenses, your own actions. You know, a lot of times we think, well, you know what? I, I, I just think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't steal. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I've never done wrong or, or I've done more good in my life than bad. I, I give to charitable organizations. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a good person, because you don't cheat on your taxes, could give, could, because you give to the Red Cross or whatever it might be, that you're going to get into heaven? You can't get to heaven based on your own actions, based on your thoughts, based on your hopes, based on your wishes, based on the pretenses that you call yourself a Christian or because you've given yourself a title. You can't get there now. Ultimately, in this place today, it would be a shame for us to leave, to walk out of this place without giving each and every one of us the opportunity to examine our hearts, to examine our lives, to, to leave with the assumption that everybody's right with God when in reality there are those of us in this place or those of you in this place that you may not be right with God. And that's why I'm speaking to you today. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. So then how do we ensure our place with God in heaven forever and ever, leaving hell behind? You say, Pastor Luke, I don't believe in heaven. Pastor Luke, I don't know that that even exists. I can't see it. I can't feel it. I don't know about any of that stuff. Let me tell you something. Let's shed that, that superficial or that shallow thinking for a moment because, you know, full well you know that there are radio waves going from me to the sound booth to the sound system because you can hear the sound of my voice, but you don't see them, you don't feel them, you don't experience them. Heaven is a real place, real enough for God to speak about it, real enough for Jesus Christ to teach us about it, real enough for you and I to take it serious today and to understand that there is a, only a one and true way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. How do we get there? Well, we think, well, if it's in our church attendance or if it's our good deeds that we can get there, but let me tell you something, it's not about that. In the book of John, in the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a man. The Bible tells us that he's a, a leader of the Jews and a Pharisee, which means that he's an educated man, a man that had spent his life, dedicated his life, devoted his life to studying the Word of God, to memorizing Scripture, to doing good deeds for others, to, to give to the poor. He taught in the synagogue or the church of his time, Nicodemus, it was his name, and Jesus and Nicodemus have the subject of the con a conversation on the subject of eternal life. And you would think, based on Nicodemus' actions, based on Nicodemus' life, that Jesus would pat him on the back and say, man, you just keep on going. Great is your reward. But Jesus says, in order to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. There it is. 
That's God's way. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in the eyes of God, in the heart of God, born again has always meant the same thing. Now, don't think about what Hollywood or society or pop culture has made it out to be. You know why? Because God never changes, but society is ever changing. Should we ne- may we never define something as important as our salvation by something that is so fickle as society. You're thinking of radical, crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about your profession. It's not about what you call yourself, what you give yourself a title. It's not about whether you think you are or you're not. It's about giving God all of your heart, all of your life. Hey, it's not even about your mental ascent or your knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. I already know you know who Jesus is. That's why you're here tonight. Did you know that the Bible tells us in the book of James that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven? It's more than your carnal knowledge or your mental ascent of who Jesus Christ is or who God is. It's about giving God all of your heart, about giving God all of your life. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, people like you and I. Speaking to the church and he says, listen, there's going to be time. I'm coming back. And when I come back, he says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. (sighs) Shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are going to be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does lukewarm mean? Let's define that. It's not a word we use very often anymore in our day and age. So what does lukewarm mean? Simply put, it means that you're a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. Doing some of, thing, doing some of God's thing, doing some of the world thing. You're riding the fence right down the middle. An uncomfortable position to be in. And Jesus Christ says that that's who you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into the kingdom of God. Church, I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough today to tell you the truth. To not play games, to not, to not be, you know, to, to want you to like me so much that I'll just let you live the way you want to. But to tell you the truth, you can't get to heaven your own way. You can't get to heaven based on your thoughts, your ideas, or your suggestions. You can't get to heaven because of your not carnal knowledge of who Jesus is. The only way you and I can get to heaven is to give God our heart, give him our life. He's already done everything he could by giving Jesus Christ his most valuable possession to die on a cross for you and I for our sins. And now in return, he wants all of our heart. He wants all of our life. So today I want to give you that opportunity. In just a moment, I'm going to count. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go one, two, on the count of three. I'm going to go three. Smack my hands together just like that, real loud. Bang. And when I smack my hands, here's what I want to do. I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with God. I want to give you the opportunity. What I want you to do is I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand, we'll do it all together at the same time. What you're doing by the raising of your hand, I see you already, my man. We'll do this in just a moment together. What you're doing is saying, hey, I want to give Jesus my heart. I want to give him my life. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, you say, man, I want to do this. You say, man, I might be embarrassed. There's already hands going up. So let me encourage you, shake that moment of embarrassment to give God your heart, to give your life. Wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward? You see, ultimately, Jesus said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his Father. But if you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his Father. The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And it's your choice today, your free will choice. God loved you enough today to give you the choice to choose him or not. He's not in the business of condemning men to hell. He's in the business of redeeming men to heaven through Jesus Christ. Today, it's your choice. So who should raise your hand in just a moment? If you never give him your heart, you never give him your life in just a moment, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You're not sure? Don't walk out of this place without making sure. If you're living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, saying you've been running from God instead of to God, hey, today, today's the day to stop playing games with God and go forward in your relationship with God all across this auditorium, wherever you're at. Listen, this is a divine appointment right now between you and God. You've had dentists and doctors and DMV appointments Now it's an appointment between you and God. This is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three all across this auditorium. You guys in the family room, wherever you're at. You in the front row, in the back row. If you're at home watching on the television or on the computer, you hear the sound of my voice around this campus. Listen, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your time. Let's quit playing games with God. Let's make sure today by giving your heart, giving your life to Jesus Christ. And we'll do that in just a moment together. But it starts by making a bold move. So I want you to pop your hand up in just a moment when I count to three. And that's you. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see that. One, two, three, four. I see those hands right there. Five, I see that hand right there. Five wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. Where are you at? I see hands pointing. I got you right there. Six. Say, man, I wonder if I got you guys back there. You can put your hands down. Six wise people. I see ushers pointing over here, but I don't see anybody else. Six wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Six wise people. Where are you at? You, You say, man, I wonder if I should. You guys in the family room, if that's you. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. Come on. Let's quit playing games with God. Let's quit messing around. 
Let's get real for God today. Six wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else in this place today? You say, man, I wonder if I should. This is your moment. This is your time. Anybody else? Just pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Anybody else today? Well, I know that there's more than six of you today. Oh, I know. I can just feel you. We can't make you. Know what I want to. It's too good. God loves you so much that he gave you the free will choice. And I want to encourage you. Seven, I see you, my man. Praise God. Wise decision. Anybody else? This is your choice. Come on, if you've got the butterflies, is that a hand in the family room? Eight, I see that hand back there. Where are you at, man? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on, you know you should. You know you should. The Bible says it's this goodness of God that draws men to repentance. It has nothing to do with me. It's God right now speaking to you. Don't ignore the call of God on your life right now. Eight wise people. Anybody else in this place today? He's saying, you should. You wonder if you should. You know that's you. Go ahead and pop your hand up. Come on, where are you at, number nine? Where are you at, number ten? That's you in this place today. Come on, that's your moment. This is your time. That's you. Come on, this is the first step of, your, of the rest of your life. Anybody else? I'm, I'm going to close this up. I can't make you. Nor would I want to. Anybody else? Well, praise God for the eight wise people that raised their hands. Here's what we're going to do. All eight of you that raised your hand, those of you in the back, the family rooms, the ushers will come. They'll help you get your stuff. Whatever you, whatever you got with you, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, friend if you need a friend. I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair, come meet me here at the aisle. We're going to change destinies right here, right now. We're all going to stand together. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair, come meet me right here. Let's pray together. Let's change destinies right here, right now, wherever you're at. You can come. Come on. That's you. You come. Yeah, come on. Congratulations. That's you. Come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come on. You can come. That's you. We'll wait for you, yeah? They're still coming. Come on, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. This is your moment. This is your time. Right here, right now. We'll wait. Come on. Yeah. Well, let's welcome them as they come. Come on. guys congratulations this is the first thing you gotta wipe that frown upside down you're not going to a funeral you're going to a birthday celebration right today's the first day of the rest of your life you're gonna get born again all right today's the your new birthday here's what i want to do i want to introduce a friend of mine to you see this guy right over here waving at you his name is pastor joel like noel but joel all right pastor joel is going to take you right over there nothing weird goes on okay i'm as weird as it gets you made it through me okay simply put he's going to take you over there he's going to lead you in a prayer okay you're going to get saved by making jesus christ your lord and savior the leader of your life second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information so that when you walk out of this place you say man what do i do now we're going to point you in the right direction of where to go the last thing he's going to do is he's going to offer you to come back and sit down with a friend, a spiritual personal trainer, we call him, a friend. Somebody will meet with you right here at church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee, teach you some things about the Word of God for a couple of weeks there, get you strong in the ways of God. Like a personal trainer would get you strong physically. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend that come alongside of you, that gets you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in all that God has for you. So if you just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life 
to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.